Well, as always, it's a joy to be in front of people that have a passion for the creative process. And I tell people that back in 1977, I attended my first year at in college, college level courses. I started photography as a, in high school, but I really didn't understand. I was on the yearbook staff and you know things like that. But it wasn't until I uh, had this professor, uh, Lou Bernal, who said that photography was more than just capturing the world around me, which is not a bad thing, right? But it's the gives you an opportunity to, to create and let yourself as an artist have an outlet uh, to express yourself. So I've been chasing that ever since. I truly believe I'm an artist. And I have a whole thing on I'm an artist, think like an artist. And I believe you're an artist too. So what defines an artist? Do you have a passion to create? You're an artist. You say, well, I've never had a gallery showing. It's okay, you're still an artist. So I've never put out a coffee table book, doesn't matter. I've never sold a print, doesn't matter. If you have a passion to create, you're still an artist. And so I believe that it doesn't matter uh, where, where you're at in your journey, um, that uh, you have a passion to create, uh, you get excited about this, uh, and it's fun to go and take and create something and call it yours. So just earlier today, we, I shot this on the floor downstairs. And um, this just came off the Canon Pro 2000. This did not exist this morning. It exists now. Isn't that fun? And I think that the, the print side of things um, is where um, when Canon called me in uh, um, and to kind of interview me, I guess you'd say, for the Canon Explorer of Light role, they said, where do you want to take your uh, photography in the next five years? And I said, I want to see my images in print. Now, I didn't know it, but the, there were some of the printer guys who were in the room. And uh, their eyes got really big because they like that too. And I love prints. And I love the ability to um, take your image and hang it. And so that's what it's all about for me. It's a be able, and I think I started out that way in the old days, uh, in, in the dark room, the dark room days. Um, seeing your print come up in that tray, oh my gosh, that was everything. That was like the most exciting thing on the planet. So, um, I love, to, I love to promote that side of things too. So I've been doing this thing where I have this, uh, one of the Canon printers is 60 inches and I, I, how I got it into my house, I don't know. But it's the size of a Volkswagen, um, maybe not that big. But um, I'm making these big 60 inch prints and I'm putting them up on my wall. I, I do like a Facebook Live thing and I'll put it on my wall and I'll talk about it. And so I'm trying to do one a week. I haven't been exact uh, on that, but to see that up on the wall this big is just, like, gives me goose pimples, goose bumps, whatever. This was actually shot in three sections. So I shot the, the Canon 5D uh, SR, horizontal, 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 three snaps, and then merged all together to make one big, huge file. So people say, why do you go to all the work to do that? Because I want to see them big. I love it. So that's what the photography is all about. All right, so let's see if this thing will advance forward. That's an HDR portrait, three clicks, uh, bracketing ISO, uh, going uh, under, over, normal. Um, and putting it together in Photoshop. We're in the greatest age of photography. Um, can't get much better. So um, we're going to talk about lighting. And so I've done a lighting, I think, uh, uh, a little bit of a lighting uh, talk here. Let's see, maybe a year ago, two years ago, I can't remember. And Dave will know, he's got a better memory than me. About two years ago. About two years ago. And, and so I think, I, I don't know what I called it, but the, what we're gonna do is talk about one light. One light. And, what, you know, I started out uh, in high school as a gymnast. I was in track and football and stuff, but then I got to be a gymnast, or I got recruited to be a gymnast. And when I first got on the gym floor, there was all these apparatuses, the high bar, the rings, the parallel bars, you know, and I wanted to get up on the bars. I used to swing in the trees. I was part monkey, and my folks said, you should be a great gymnast, but I want to get on the bars. Well, um, our coach said, well, before you get on the bars, you got to learn how to do a forward roll uh, on the ground. 
And so um, this sounds really simple, right? But if you're a brick, you don't roll very smooth. And that's what we did. We'd go, bunk, 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 bunk. And we'd stand up, roll, stand up, right? And until I got that fluid motion of rolling on the ground, the coach wouldn't let me get on the bars to roll, right? And so I was really impatient, but I had to learn how to be patient to move to the next level. And so when it comes to lighting, often what we do is we go and we grab a bunch of lights and we want to go and become, you know, a famous photographer and we go and we just make a disaster of it. Because we've gotten, we've, we haven't, we've kind of skipped past the basics. And so when I teach, I want to teach, and I always say I teach at about an eighth grade level, because that's about how I think. Um, so I hope everyone's qualified here on that. But I don't want to get too complicated. And lighting often is taught, and it's too complicated. And so I want to make it as simple as possible for you guys. So is anybody confused? Well, I get confused very easily with things. Uh, Photoshop is one of those things that confuses me. I have to dive in there. Um, but as an artist, the first thing you got to do is figure out where you want to end up. And isn't that true in anything? So if you're going to take a road trip and you're going to drive to Texas from here, do you think it would be smart to go through Seattle? Unless you wanted to go through Seattle. But if you want to get there in the shortest amount of time, you take the shortest route, right? So you find out how to get there. Uh, often what we do is we go and we, we're like a dog chasing our tails and we don't really know where we're going and we just kind of, you know, we think we're going to land somewhere, you know, but you got to learn where you want to end up. So what's a good way to figure that out? Well, when you go and you, uh, I used to be, I used to look, flip through magazines back when they actually had magazines you looked at. Now it's all online pretty much, but I'd flip through stuff. I'd go down to the used uh, bookstore and get these magazines, uh, 25 cents a piece. I'd fill them up, take about 50 of them home. I'd sit there on the floor and I'd flip through the magazine and I'd go, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. Oh my, that's a nice picture. Rip it out, put it in a pile. And at the end of the day, I'd have a stack of pictures that represented what I liked. And then I'd take that stack and I'd go, how do I go and do that? How do I go and learn how to do that? So that helped narrow it down. Well, we have the internet today. We can go and look at images and get an idea of what we like. Because your intuition is your best guide. Your intuition says, I like, I don't like, just like with music. And so you got to figure out what you like. Now, here's what I know for a fact, that when I produce something, I put it out there, there's a group of people that are going to like it, and there's a pre pe group of people that will not like it. A guarantee. Not everyone's going to like what I do. Uh, <coughs> because we all have preferences, <coughs> and we, we don't all like the same thing. Um, all right, so as a general rule, lighting in the real world around us. Every day when I walk out, I walk outside, I walk out in the, in the showroom out here, I'm walking in the subway. Lighting generally does not make me look very good. Usually adds about 10 years and about 30 pounds. Harsh light, whatever. And so, so when people say, I'm a natural light photographer, I go, well, you, you got to know lighting, no matter if it's natural light or not, you got to know lighting. What looks good on a, someone's face? So um, when it comes to strobes and modifiers, you got to go learn what looks good and makes people look good, right? So you want people to buy what you do. Like if you're going to be uh, photographing celebrities, you got to make them look good. And of course, Photoshop helps too. But lighting is very important. And so there's good light and bad light. Now, there's no such thing as the wrong light. Because every scenario you can think of, like right now, this is harsh light across my face. That's not going to probably make me look the best. But with moving the lights around, you can make me look better, look me look a little bit thinner, a little bit younger. And so that's what our subjects want. We want to look good. So that's your job. You're an artist. Hopefully that's your job, is you want to make your subject look good. And so lighting is that. There's no right or wrong, except there are some light that looks better. So as a general rule, also we look at lighting. Um, if, it, if it falls from top to bottom, that's pretty good lighting. And from really nice soft cross light looks good too. That's usually a good two uh, lighting arenas, or I, or I say angles or you know, ways of shooting is best. Top down, cross light. I'm going to show you a bunch of that. 
but with one light. Now, if you add an edge light here, an edge light there, hair light, I don't have any hair, but you know what? If, if I did, I could say I had a hair light. But the fact is, is the, the edge lights, or you know, the, the key light or, or on the sides, usually accents and gives you a little bit of snap, right? And that's good for sports, I do that a lot. Um, but you need to learn first how to photograph a subject with one light. And then you build from there. Now, we know that one light, we have these terms. I don't know all these terms because I didn't go to school for lighting. I was in the fine arts. And so people say, oh, I, I see that you're doing uh, clamshell lighting. Huh? I see you're doing, you know, the hatchet light, whatever. Like, the hell these names. I'm like, what? What? I've, I've spoke at different colleges, and I'll get up there and do my lighting presentation, and the professor's in the back going, oh, my gosh, this guy doesn't know anything about lighting because, yeah, I don't know all the terms. But I know what looks good on subjects. That's what I do know. So the, the name of the lighting technique means nothing, but does it look good? And so, but you got to learn how to go and use uh, uh, one light and work from there. So, um, but top down or cross light is really the best light. All right, so let's do this. I'm going to go through. I've, I've, I, you know, some of you may have seen this presentation at least this part. We're going to eventually get to uh, some hands-on stuff too. But I'm going to talk about uh, the quality of light. Um, we talked, someone mentioned Dean Collins uh, this morning. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore, but he was a great educator, and he, he used some terms, he made up some terms, and he was great at, at teaching lighting. He used specular light and all this stuff. I'm going to even go simpler than Dean Collins. He made it simple. I'm going to go even simpler than he did, and that is this. If you can think of this and split light into this, it's I can either learn how to make light harsher or softer. Do I want it harsher? Or softer I look at it and also my definition of harsh and soft may be different than yours but the fact is if I know how to make it softer if the client says I want it softer or you say I want it softer you know how to do that you want a harsher you know how to do that and that's by doing a couple things I'm gonna show you how to do that but if you can get that simple understanding lighting is really easy so watch how I do this yes yes All right, there are two things that you can have to think about that determine the quality of light. So let's talk about quality of light is when I can create light that looks good on someone's face, the quality of light. There's two things that um, you need to understand that control that, right? So the first thing is the size of your source and how far it is from your subject. That's number one. So here we have a 24 inch beauty dish, 24 inches. Now, um, that's actually a fairly small modifier, um, but your standard flash head is, and usually with the reflectors, about eight inch reflector, that's pretty small. So that's actually going bigger and making it a little bit softer. Um, so the size and the distance, how far it is from your subject determines how soft or how harsh it is. And the second thing that you got to understand is that there's a bounce or ambient that comes into the scene that also softens the light. So earlier today, we did a photograph of our beautiful model and I had never, a Lenny, if I get that right, a Lenny. And we took a little reflector. So we had the one light over the top. We took a little reflector and that reflector bounced light back in and it softened the overall look. So it's how much reflection or ambient. So in here, we pass some continuous lights, but if you're outdoors and you start to let your shutter, you know, go a little longer, you bring in ambient, that ambient softens the light. So you have to understand that these two principles right here are what you need to understand to control your quality of light from going harsher or softer. So to make a source softer, you get a bigger modifier or you move it in. So the closer you move that modifier, softer, softer, softer. Now you have to account for the f-stop or the amount of output in your strobe but when you get a soft get this close it's really soft you get back here it's harsher harsher and harsher so you have to understand that now there's some mathematical equations you can write out and do all that but I'm lousy at math and most, most of us aren't very good at math and so I'm gonna try to teach light without number one using a flash meter I had a flash meter it broke in 1986 and I haven't touched one since um, the, what I discovered about a flash meter was it's a great tool to measure how much light hits that dome. It does not tell you where to put the light. 
and there's confusion on how where you point it toward the light source, between the subject, all that stuff. Now, some people get really good at light meters, I don't know. But the point is, is I also don't use lighting ratios. So you can say, you know, we got one to four, you know, lighting ratios. Well, that's confusing because that's fractions. And I hate fractions. <laughs> and so um, I also don't use a schematic. So the schematic is, here's a picture, here's a, you know, here's a little body. And I actually have one little schematic I use in here, but I try to avoid schematics at all costs because a schematic, schematic doesn't really give you the right information. For example, you have a picture of a little umbrella and a person standing next to it, and you say, 10 feet away. Well, how big is that umbrella? Well, you say, you can say, actually tell the, the umbrella, but how much ambient light's coming in the scene? All these information that you know that actually controls the quality of light, you're not giving in a schematic, typically. And so I try to avoid schematics, and um, I don't use modeling lights. Um, people ask, why don't you use modeling lights? And uh, part of it is that in the old, I say older days, but in some of the older strobes, remember how hot they used to get? And some, I actually melted some of my strobes or you know, uh, modifiers caught on fire and stuff like that. So I just got used to not using modeling lights, and plus I use a lot of battery packs that don't allow you to m use modeling lights. Or if you do, it drains the pack really fast, right? So I got used to not using modeling lights, and what I use is the back of the monitor on the camera and my intuition. That tells me if I'm on the right track. Um, all right, so we have um, to soften the light, you move it closer. To harshen, you move it back. All right, that makes sense. Um, if you also, if you take a, um, um, a fill card, that softens it, but also I use black a lot. I, I'll, let's say I have a picture of a, I'm uh, required to photograph a, a CEO and he's in his office and I got the natural light coming in and I go, okay, hmm. I put my softbox over here and I throw the light in the direction it's already going. I got this gorgeous light on his face. And, but, but there's a big white wall right here and it's acting as a big bounce. It's too much. It's filling all the Rembrandt, you know, quality of light that I want, the drama. So I, have, I always carry these big sheets of black cloth and I tape them up. Hopefully you don't peel the tape off and take the, the paint with it. But you take and you block the light so it absorbs it. So that I get that, you know, the, the quality exactly the way I want. And so I use uh, all sorts of uh, either white or black to control the, the ambient or the reflective. Um, all right, so let's just keep going here. The shape, here it is. This is the most confusing thing on the planet. We all know that there's, um, let's see, we got a beauty dish. We've got mm, the octo, that's the octo, pretty close to the beauty dish. We've got uh, square, rectangular. We've got, um, let's see, there's, there's modifiers that, uh, you know, you can use a, a shower, shower curtain, you know, shoot through a soft shower curtain. Uh, there's so many things, you can, a white wall. You know, a lot of the photographers years ago, before big softbox, they used flats. They just shot into a big flat and bounced light back in. So the shape of the modifier we think has a lot to do with the quality of light. Well, it doesn't. So if I take, there's an octobox, that's beautiful. I love that light. It's very simple to use. Um, but if I had a rectangular box that it was the same amount of square inches of illuminated surface, you could not tell the difference on the subject in terms of quality of light. The difference is the catch light in the eye. That's where the difference is. So I told this early this morning that in the 60s, when strobes started becoming popular and, and fashion photographers started using um, strobes. They had umbrellas. They didn't really have soft boxes back then. It wasn't until the 80s that soft, bo soft boxes came along. And so um, the fashion photographers used these big umbrellas and it became very popular to have a round catch light in the eye. And so we use that today. Sort of like the standard, you know, the, a benchmark that we have is have a round catch light. I still do that today. I love, I love round catch lights in the eye. Um, so that's why we use, you typically use a rectangular shape over the camera to get around catch light. Now, if you're photographing a product for a client and it's a reflected, you know, a, a soda can or a bottle or something, or a watch, you always use a rectangular or squared up modifier because you have sharp edges, right? So that, that sits nicely in the roundness of the bottle or whatever. You never use a round um, modifier for something like that, for a product, for, for uh, reflection. And so that's, that definitely changes, not the quality light, but the reflection. So don't get caught up on the shape so much. I happen to like round modifiers, and I, ha use, I, have, um, well, I, have, I have the little teeny 20-inch rapid box. 
I have now the, the 24. I used the 36 inch rapid box a lot. I went to Iceland, I took two strobes and one modifier. The 36 inch rapid box. Because before I had my 24. Now I take my 24, but the fact is, is it was a pretty decent sized modifier, um, but outdoors I don't need a big modifier. And so, um, but I have a five footer and I have a seven footer. So I mix those up, depending, I'm gonna show you in a minute how that works, mix them up depending on what I want. And then I have my rectangular boxes, I have some big large ones, some, uh, some extra large ones, and some little teeny ones. And I mix them all up and to get the quality I want. And also, often I work in spaces that aren't very big. So a big seven foot octo gets to be a little bit too bulky when you're in a room like this. Um, so I may have to go and, and adjust accordingly to get my boxes to fit in where I want. Well, if you're on the road like I've done, annual reports, I used to do, now I do a lot of ad stuff, but um, you get what you get sometimes. A closet, here's your, your shooting, the CEO in a closet, right? Or some you know, famous athlete. So you gotta kinda go on the fly and figure it out. You know, I don't have enough room. Well, this is what you get. Um, all right, so shape, but don't be caught up by the shape. And we, um, we already mentioned, Dave, um, uh, we talked about, the, you know, Westcott's an amazing company. Uh, not only do I believe in their products, but I believe them as a company. And they've treated me really well. But when it comes to modifiers, you know you can find a cheaper modifier somewhere, right? And you can also can find one that's more expensive. Westcott's in there somewhere. But the quality is that you should, have, you should buy a modifier that lasts you 10 to 15 years, at least 10 to 15 years. And so um, if you buy a cheaper one, often what happens is it falls apart within a year or so. And so that's why I believe in their products. And um, so you get what you pay for. But again, don't be enamored by necessarily the shape or even the name on the outside. What's really important is how big that modifier is and how far away or how close it is to your subject. That's the most important thing. All right, so the question about is uh, that a modifier will have a wraparound effect. Well, when, I, when it comes to this, the wraparound, okay, so a wraparound is when your modifier happens to do one thing. If, this, if the light source is in the center, okay, you have a baffle in the middle or a beauty dish, the light bounces into that beauty dish or into that baffle and it disperses the light evenly across the front of your modifier. Okay, so that, that's, that's what a modifier should do. So the baffle is not to, you can't put three baffles in and make it softer. The baffle inside disperses the light evenly because you have a, a round center uh, source. So what you want is that even distribution of light on the front panel. So when it came to this beauty dish, we went through four different versions revisions and I kept testing this because I wanted to make sure that front panel was illuminated equally and so we went through a bunch of different versions um, when it comes to a wraparound effect you could say if I'm in the middle of a seven foot octo okay and it's right here bink, the outside of the octo is going to be further from my face and the center right so Naturally, I get a gradated wraparound effect because it's, it's going to be brighter in the center. This is it when it's close. And it's going to be further on the edges because here's it's going to be way out here. If I back that up 20 feet, that's not going to have much of an effect. So when I do cross light, I'm going to show you in a minute. I run my cross light octobox 90 degrees to my camera and my subject right here, 90 degrees, cross. Because the, 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 the outside of the uh, octobox, the furthest part of the octobox, takes longer for the light to get to the face. Therefore, I get a wraparound effect, a gradated effect. So I'm not sure if that's what you mean. But a good, a, the modifier should be able to give you equal amount of light distributed across from corner to corner on, your modif on the front of your modifier, the diffusion. Does that make sense? So when you say wrap around, that's by positioning the box accordingly. Now, there are some boxes, and I think Westcott has one, I think Bruce Dorn designed it, where the light is set in one side and it's the, the box is actually tapered so that this corner or this edge of the box pr produces less light than the center or the, the, the one side. So that'll give a wrap around or a gradated effect. So we'll talk about that. So let me, let, let me see if we can address that. So here we have a small, I know, don't go and criticize my illustrations here. 
Um, I just cut that out of one of my pictures. Um, but let's say we have a small modifier up close. If that wall is white in my studio, a small modifier up close will cause that, that white wall to be gray, dark gray, depending on how close I have her. But it's not going to be pure white because the value of the light is, is set up to be illuminated equal, or for her face. So the light falls off in the back. So white becomes gray. Um, but if I take a small modifier, let's say, let's say call that a three footer at three feet, um, and I go, you know what though? I can't do that because I, my camera, I'm going to use a 7200 millimeter lens. I can't get uh, underneath that modifier. So what's my options? Well, a five footer at five feet will give me the exact same quality of light on her face as a three footer at three feet. You may not believe this, but it's true. It's the craziest thing on the planet. No mathematics here. You don't have to figure out a formula. I'll show you how to figure it out really easily. Here's a seven footer at seven feet, roughly. And this, this scale is not perfect. But the point I want you to get is that if I set up a, let's do it this way. Watch this. So a three, oh, hold on, I can click it here. A three footer, see now watch what happens. This modifier now makes the background a light gray, but the quality of light on her face is the same. Obviously the light's gonna spread more because now, and of course, if you have a white floor on your studio, it's gonna bounce back up. But the quality of her face is exactly the same at a five foot modifier at feet, five feet is a three foot modifier at three feet or a seven foot modifier at seven feet. So here's what I do. Let's say I have my model, I have my three foot modifier and I go, oh yes, beautiful light. And the client says, you know what? I want her lit more. Just nice on her face, great, but I want her lit more. We're trying, to, we're trying to sell dresses. And I go, oh, no problem. I take my five footer out, pop it up, and I go and I tell my assistant to stand right where my model is. And I go, okay, let me back this up until it fits the same diameter as my, my three footer. Pull the three footer out. Of course, I can hit my exposure correctly. I get the same quality of light as my three footer. Same thing with a seven footer. Now, I discovered this by accident, because I, what I did was, I just brought subjects in and started playing. And all of a sudden, this all made sense. Now, why, here's another thing. For how many years, let's see, 30 years, when every time I needed a white background, I lit it. I put two lights on it and lit it. And I discovered that I don't have to do that anymore because I have a seven footer. I put it at about seven to eight, 10 feet, somewhere around there. And that white sweep behind her is pure white. And the perfect value of white, it's not overblown white. What happens is if you get too much light on your background, it causes flare to come into your lenses and it degrades your image. Um, so you get a crisp, clean uh, image on your uh, value on your subject and the wall's not blown out. So I use, so if Nike came to me and said, we got this athlete and we want to do a portrait head to toe, we want the shoes to really come up, you know, nice and bright and strong, you know, so we can see it, I would pull out a big modifier and back it way up and get my whole lit subject with a white sweep. Ready? Move on? Let's keep going. Um, so for an overhead light, the rule of thumb is this. If you can get this down, it's really simple, and I hate to go and put rules out there, but take the diameter of your modifier, and then take and put that from the distance from your subject. This morning we did a gorgeous shot uh, where we took our 24 inch beauty dish, put it at 24 inches from our model, and guess what happens? The cheeks get hollow. And that's what all women want, hollowed cheeks. And we do a little makeup on there, it helps. You know, but that's why, because, so if you think about this, if I have a light eight feet out and I'm coming toward my model, that light's hitting my subject at this angle. But if it's close, it cuts across the cheeks. So a beauty dish, um, generally we call it beauty dish, I think, because it has a dish in the middle and it makes women look really beautiful because it's close in generally close in and it hollows the cheeks. And so take, so I have a five footer, I take it five feet, at five, at, uh, five feet is really beautiful soft light on the subject. But if I take a five foot modifier and bring it in three feet, it's gonna be even more soft, even softer. And so a seven footer at three feet, oh my goodness. And I do that, I do that often. 
So once I learned this basic rule of, I don't know what you call it, lighting 101, then all of a sudden, the mystery of lighting, the chains fell off, the scales fell off, and all of a sudden it all made sense to me. And so I've been teaching it now, and it's kind of fun. So let's go back to this. You're the artist. You determine what you want. And so again, our de definitions may all be the same. You may say that's too harsh. You may say it's too soft. But in the end, we know how to go harsher and softer by adjusting our modifiers. So let's look at real-time images. Real, I mean, I'm shooting it. And here I am, and I made a mistake. I, I can't go back, or I didn't go back. I'll have to redo this. I should have put a black cloth on the floor. I didn't realize at the time. I was just in a hurry. Got my, my beautiful model, Bryce, and we set it up in my studio, and um, I took a white sweep, and I, I just set my modifiers up, tried to get them about equal, I mean, in terms of, you know, and it's not exact science, but here we go. Watch what happens. Here's a three-foot uh, rabbit box at three feet. Um, we have a little bit of a fill cart, but uh, look at the quality of light on her face. Ready? So we're going to go and put a five-footer at five feet. And so now, unfortunately, we got a little bit of balance on the floor, coming in more. So it's filling in underneath here. But roughly, now the light is more distributed e equally across her, but the quality of light on her face is the same. Here's a seven footer at seven feet. The white, look how bright the background got. Let's look at all three at the same time. So here's a three footer at three feet. Look how gray the background is. A five footer at five. She hasn't moved. Okay, the background hasn't moved. And here's a seven footer at seven feet. Now again, had I have a black floor, it would have been a little bit more accurate um, in terms of balance underneath. But um, what that does, that tell you that if you can mix it up like that, you can, now, if I, Let's say there's a lot of balance coming in her. So I would have to get a bigger balance over here to get that same underneath the chin. But the quality on her face is exactly the same up on top. Let's go full length. So look how dark her shoes are on the bottom. That's a small modifier. And even a 24 foot or 24 inch would be even, even uh, closer, but uh, even, even more of a fall off. But here we go, watch the um, uh, the uh, shoes, they start to get some value. And then we have the uh, uh, seven footer. And now you see detail on the shoes. So if you're doing catalog work and you wanna have a lot of models coming and going and you don't have time to move lights around, you say, okay, we gotta go light head to toe, get a big modifier, back it up. And it spreads the light and it also, you get some great quality of light on her. Same quality of light. And so this is fun. Once you understand this, there's all three side by side. And again, I didn't take a measuring tape out here. I was doing it pretty fast. But basically, you get the pr principle. You get the principle. And really, lighting is all about practice anyway. So I can only give you a, a, a jump start. I can't tell you everything about lighting. You need to go practice it yourself. So, um, so let's go to cross light. Cross light is gorgeous light. And so I, I, I had to teach a, a class. and. They had to come up with a title, and I thought, well, I called um, the most beautiful light on the planet because the painters used it, Rembrandt, uh, the, the broke Renaissance time period. And so when I started lighting, I, I remember art history. I remember Rembrandt, the, the, those painters, modeling light. And so I didn't have any formal, formal lighting training. The first thing I did was take a soft box and do cross light. That's all I knew. And I did that actually for 25 years. And I made a lot of money doing just one light cross light. And then when digital came along and things started changing, that's when I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go and try two lights, three lights. And that edgy sports light that I do a lot of, that came out of that. I just thought, I'm gonna try something different. But I still love the cross light, one light is still, and I'm actually bringing it back now, meaning in my, my workflow, I'm bringing cross light back and um, I'm actually loving it. Now that we have digital too, I can fiddle, I can do the, did you, the guys, well, this was a gray background. Remember, did I tell you this? We shot this on a gray background, 50% gray background. And in about 10 minutes in Photoshop, I added this texture, Not, no extract, no cutting them out. I made a simple little mask, and I put the background above him with a 
blending mode of overlay. Overlay and soft light, they all, they all work with gray, 50% gray. So knowing that, I can now have one background, which we, uh, I, I take with me all the time, but I didn't bring it. It's the real 5x7, 5x7 um, Westcott with the kit. What's the kit called? The X, X drop. X drop, it's not expensive. It sets up in, I set the whole thing up in, I think it was 60 seconds, less than, it's under 100 bucks, or about 100 bucks. $119. And that is what I normally shoot with this, but we just did it down to downstairs. But so I don't have to have all these different backdrops. All I need is textures. You can shoot any texture, concrete, an old bri bridge, you know, stained bridge, whatever it is. Um, so, so the point is, is understanding, understanding my, um, you know, how to use gray, that's opened a whole new door to me, and I'm using crosslight a lot with it too. This happened, I used just a, 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 an old backdrop I had from the 90s, but let's just do this. Let me show you how I go and, and, and make my crosslight look like what Rembrandt did. And I got in trouble, I put a picture up in Facebook, and, and I said, you know, it's Rembrandt, I call it, I call it Rembrandt crosslight. Well, I'm, I guess apparently, you're not supposed to mix those two terms together. Someone didn't like it, and they wanted me to go to Wikipedia, and to look up the definition of Rembrandt lighting. And Rembrandt, according to Wikipedia, he put his light at a 45 degree angle. And so most of my assistants, when I get them for the first time, I say I want to do cross light, Rembrandt light, and they all set it up 45 degree angle. I come over and I go swing it back over to 90 degrees. And they look at me like, wait, you're not supposed to do that. They were taught 45 degrees. But here's how I have come up with the um, the reason why I run it at 90 degrees complete cross light, and that's this. I'll show you in a minute on the gradation. But if Ram Rembrandt ran his source, which was a window, at 45 degrees, let's say you're my subject, and I'm painting you, and I got my window at 45 degrees, where does that put me? Outside the wall of his house. That doesn't make any sense. Or if he was inside the house, he's literally up against the wall and he's, you know, you're off on the side. So if you look at the Dutch painters, a lot of them, they actually put their source window in the picture. They painted it in. It's always 90 degrees. Cross. So I'm not an expert, but I tell you that's what I believe. Okay? So someone can correct me. I don't, you know, I guess I'm not, not worried about it at this point. Who knows? They probably did rotate the person in the in the, and maybe they used a fill card. Maybe it was a Westcott fill card. I don't know. <laughs> um, but let's just do this. I'm going to show you my little technique on how I do cross light. And I did this for 25 years, and I probably photographed 10,000 portraits, if not more, with this technique. So I've done it a few times. So let's show how I do it. Now I'm going to show you a schematic. I hate these. You know, I hate doing this. But here we have our, our Octobox, and it is a Westcott Octobox, by the way. <laughs> and you know, uh, by the way, you don't have to have the, the Octobox. You can take the seven foot umbrella with the diffusion and put your light source in the middle, bounce in, bounce the light through. It is exactly the same quality light as an Octobox. So why would you go and spend the extra money for an Octobox? Well, if you're gonna shoot day in and day out, and you built your whole career on a seven foot modifier, you might as well buy the Octobox, because it's going to last probably a little longer. And it's a little bit more, you know, in the wind and stuff, it's a little bit more uh, uh, sturdy. Uh, but if you're on a budget, and I've got two of, of the uh, seven-foot umbrellas, and I generally use the white. I have a silver set, too, but white with the white diffusion on the front, it's gorgeous light, and what is it, 130 bucks total, instead of 700 bucks or whatever. So it doesn't matter, this is gonna be the same. And in fact, I've used the umbrella for demos for years. Parabolic? It's a parabolic umbrella. Right. Yeah. Seven footer, 82, 80, whatever, four inches. 100 bucks. 100 bucks, with the diffusion. Right, the diffusion white diffusion, right? Yep, it's really wonderful. And I mix it up all the time. All right, here we go. So, not very flattering picture right here, right? So is Bryce, she's a gorgeous, beautiful model, but she doesn't look the, her best. Now you could say that's acceptable, I don't know. I hope you don't. 
I hope you say, let's make it better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, all I'm going to do is not change my exposure or anything. I'm going to move this, uh, this modifier this direction away from the, from the background. Watch what happens. I'm going to do it in eight inch increments. Ready? First one. Bink. Now watch what happens. The, here comes the Rembrandt triangle, starting to get a little bit brighter. No exposure change. These are just JPEGs, too, out of the camera. There it is a little bit more. Now, why is that happening? Remember I said to you that look how far away this part of this, the, the, the modifier is. It takes a lot more distance to get to this side of the face. So what's happening, this acts as a huge gradated source, which gives you a more smoother wraparound. Now, I used to test this. I used to do a demo. I'd take a, a stool. I'd take a soda can, take a piece of uh, typing paper or, or copy paper, and make a cylinder, white cylinder. And I would take my source and put it at 45 degree angles, have the whole class in there with a molly light in there. And all of a sudden, I'd have someone just move the box like that. And here's what happens. You have the light hitting on the, the cylinder, and it's pure white. You get your exposure. And then it goes to pure black, right? And so the minute you go and go like this, you, the distance between your pure white and your pure, pure black stretch. You automatically know it's spreading out the tones. Now, Ansel Adams taught the, the, you know, the zone system, and I studied the zone system. And most photographers want more latitude or more tonal value in their images. And by doing this, you get a greater wrap, smoother tonal range. Here goes another eight inches. Now we're starting to get a little bit more of the, this, this transition right here starts to be a little more detail, a little more smoother. She's starting to look a lot more gorgeous. And so she's now starting to like this image. And I'm going to put a little fill card on the side. So here comes a little fill card. You got to be careful. You don't want to overuse a fill card. But there's the fill. And it happens to be a Westcott little fill card. Uh, it's not very big. You don't have to have too big of a source. Um, and then, actually, I use foam core, too, on, on occasion. But um, can't pack up foam core, though. Um, and then I'm going to go overdo it, just to show you that when you overdo it, um, it might be a little too much. That might be a little too much. But maybe not, for your taste. If it's a beautiful you know, model, beautiful campaign you're working on. Um, so there we go. So that is how I fine tune my 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 box, my or my uh, octa, octa bank. How far is the octa bank from the Seven inches? No, not seven inches, but probably about a foot and a half, maybe. Now, the bigger the source, the softer the light. So if I back this up, it's going to get harsher and harsher and harsher. Now, here's a really interesting thing. I found out by accident. I had this girl come into my studio, and she um, couldn't sit still. She was like a free spirit. And she'd like, I'd get everything set up, and she'd be standing there, and all of a sudden, she's over, she's over here. I'm like, oh, no, 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 get back in your little spot, right? So what I did was, I set two of these up, backed them up, and made a, two really big modifiers. But because they were so big, the, and two of them, I could now get about 15, 10, 15 feet from her. And she could move around. And that, so if you have a ballerina or something going on, or a group shot of you know, four or five people, that light now can distribute more evenly across that space. So it's not as critical. But usually about it, um, uh, as close as I want, as close as I can get it before it shows up in my frame. So the closer I get that box to her, the softer it is. So that's why a seven footer at seven, or at, at, you know, at about three, two feet, a foot and a half is going to be the, the best, just out of frame. Do you use grids? There's no grids for this, OK? I use grids on the back of my edge lights when I do my sports figures because they're coming at a 45 degree angle. And I shoot wide angle a lot. 24 millimeters, a, a good lens choice for me at full frame, 24 millimeter. And if you don't have grids, you get tons of flare, tons of flare. Now, you can get. You can flag those off, but then you get two more light stands and two more things sitting between you and your subject. But I use grids for flare when it comes in the background. I wouldn't, if you put grids here, you would kill that whole gradated effect right here. So I wouldn't use grids on this scenario. All right, so let's look at some images I just snapped of Bryce. Here they are, JPEGs, no retouching, right out of the camera. I had my 7200 just snapping away. And, and basically, I didn't move anything, but just zooming in and out, and she's moving a little bit. Beautiful, soft, gorgeous light. Using your reflector that's going out. The reflector was over there, yes. You can make a lot of money with this lighting technique, folks. 
because it's beautiful. It's going to be here. It's not going to. It's not going to die. I mean, it's not going to. It's going to come a little bit in and out of style. I would say, but I almost think we went through that edgy kind of look now, and we're going back to soft look, right? Yeah, and I like soft look. I love. I love it. And so, um, uh, yeah, you want to build a body of work and, and make some money. Mm. That's 130 bucks, and you're in business in a piece of foam core or a Westcott reflector. So I, I, while I had Bryce there, I thought, I have this roller wall. I had to put a piece of white on it before. I rolled it over, and I put it against this wall. And I had this one gray, that one painted gray. And I put, took this black cloth, and I just pulled it right through. And I uh, thought, let's do something kind of fun. It's just the same, that, basically the same as that, only I didn't have it at the time. That's just 22 inch beauty dish. And the thing is, is look how beautiful that light is. I got a little fill card. Look how beautiful. I put a box up here, but I really didn't use it. I didn't, I didn't turn it on during this exposure. Um, one light. Now watch this. Beautiful fine art kind of a feel to it. One light. And you know what I just did last weekend at uh, Cannon Learning Center? I took two of those five by seven grays, put them together, and did a whole wedge wall right there with two little teeny pop-ups. And it looked unbelievable. So you don't have to have an expensive wall to do it. And if you don't like your model, she gets a little mad at you, you can just kind of cover up her face. Your light's coming more from the top on that one. Same thing, I didn't move anything. Same light, just right over the top, boom. Um, but what I'm saying here is just play. Now, I didn't have any idea I would do this even the wedge wall, I wasn't planning on, hey, Bryce, let's do the wedge wall look. We finished up, and I said, oh, I got an idea. Can you just stay for a little bit longer? And she said, sure. And so my point is, is that Richard Avedon said this. He said, give me a subject, give me a white sweep, and let the magic happen, right? And that's really what it's all about. Remember I showed, today I was showing you that, um, that picture of the cowboy? And I said, the, the hardest part about producing that cowboy shot was not the technical part of it. It's getting the cowboy and the horse out in an open field at the right time of day. That's the hard part. It takes a couple of weeks of phone calls and getting the horse and getting the model and getting, you know, and he shows up perfect, right? He's got this old, you know, well, he's got 70, 65 years of craggly, you know, weather on his face. But he's got this old hat and his old chaps and everything. And he used to be a, a working cowboy. But the point is, is it's putting it together. So get somebody in front of your lens and play. So I try to do that 50 self-assignments a year, apart from my commercial work and teaching and all this stuff I do. I drive my wife crazy, because I'm always, every time I come home, I've got a shoot schedule, because I want to play. It's not work, it's play. It's me going out and exp trying, to, trying something new. And I do some crazy things. I'm bracketing ISO now with my strobes to get HDR portraits. So I have a 32-bit file to give me all these incredible tones. And so, I love it. All right, so let's look at some examples here of just one light overhead. So what you guys saw, that was similar to this shot, same thing, gray background, five by seven, popped up. We did this at Adobe, uh, it was their um, headquarters in San, San Jose, and it was um, one of Russell Brown's events, the uh, Adam event, and um, I was just, just starting this technique, and I thought, I need someone with a really cool looking beard. And he walked by. <laughs> so <laughs> I gotta grab him. And I can set that little pop up anywhere. And it's just the gray background. Just gray background. And then I add the texture later gray in Photoshop. Photoshop. Yeah. And so um, one light over top. Now here's a wrapper, uh, Mustafa. Uh, same thing. One little, one little, it was 22 inch beauty back then, but now it's the same thing. <laughs> and it's just right out of the camera view, just shooting right underneath. And that is a pretty close to the natural vignette that happened because it was a solid wall. It was not a paper sweep, solid painted wall. Um, it was actually orange, and of course, they, I, in Photoshop, I just changed it. But um, look how the taperedness goes down. Look how the value goes down. You can barely see his hand here. Um, and so that's a 24 millimeter lens, a wide, a full frame. So people say, you can't use a 24 on a, uh, on a subject. Why not? Now you gotta make sure he pulls the mic toward him so he's not sticking away out here, or unless you want that, but you know. 
So same thing, I shoot like this all the time. And this is gonna be a little bigger with a 24 millimeter lens. But what guy doesn't want big forearms, right? <laughs> so um, I, love, I love drama, I love drama. Now this was at a workshop in, uh, in um, um, where am I at? Well, anyways. No, it's up in uh, New Hampshire or whatever. Um, no, I can't even think. It's out, out there where all the rich people are. <laughs> Martha's Vineyard. Wherever it is, up there. Nantucket. Nantucket. That's what it is. Nantucket. And so w it was kind of windy day, and so we were we had all the you know the attendees, and we were out there, and I said stop. We all jumped out, and I set that up in about literally five minutes, and. It's just one, one beauty dish type over the top, and I'm, I'm producing uh, 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 my shutter speed in this overcast day to where there's value here, but it's darker. So this is all darker. And she was so cold, she, we had this blanket. And so she put the blanket on, and then when it, we did the proofs, and then she's like, you know, do you want to take the blanket off? I go, no, keep it. And so, but that's one light. It's so fun. This is uh, uh, Vincent. He's uh, one of my regulars in Phoenix when I do my workshops. Um, so th this one, and it, uh, it's kind of hard to explain the why I do HDR, but that was HDR, three clicks, and one light over the top. Exposure, what, two up, two down? One up. One up. Outdoors, I do two up, two down. But indoors in studio, I just do one. Um, this was one light. It's the 30, I think it's the 36-inch rapid box. It was at Texas School. And I purposely went really dark. So I got a dark black background. She's just a piece of cloth. We just sat up against a piece of cloth. And then I put the top over here. And we had, I think we had a little bit of a, maybe it was the eye eyeliner was just underneath her, but really low. So it was like almost like this far down, as far as we get it to go. And then um, in Photoshop, of course, I did, I, uh, remember I did a demo this morning where I took the slider on the black and white. I went to the r uh, right, no, the left, and it darkened her skin. And it's really simple, and I do this all the time. And I have all sorts of tutorials on this stuff. Um, but isn't that fun? I mean, I'm telling you. She just showed up. She was our model. I didn't know who she was coming. She just showed up, and I said, okay, I got an idea. Let's do it. And um, the funny thing was is, and people ask me, hey, you're really good at posing people. I go, no, I'm not. Not really. And they go, well, how do you get these great poses? And I go, you know what I do? I let the model do their thing. So I'm asking her, I go, can you know, just do something? And she just goes, beak, into this pose. I'm like, ah, stop, there's my shot. And I, you know, then you have 30 people behind you doing the same shot. But, but they didn't get, I, I did this Photoshop. They don't always, you know, do the same Photoshopping. All right, I showed this earlier this, this morning. Um, well, on my phone, because I didn't have it. But here's, here's an interesting uh, way to kind of do things. I'm taking a 7200 at 200 millimeter. I got my Canon 5D SR, and I'm uh, shooting at 2.8 outdoors. Now, this is like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, or whatever. So the, it, we're kind of in the shade here, but the sun's coming back through there a little bit through the trees. And I expose, I have um, my same kind of setup here, on, and my, my assistant's got on a, light, on, a, on a painter's pole. And I had this whole thing, by the way, um, behind the scenes of how he did the same with the cowboy guy, too. It's, um, it's on my website, joelgrindsworkshops.com, but MZ and I uh, partnered up, and it shows how I did this, but, and all the Photoshop on it, too. But here's the framing of the 200 millimeter frame right there. And I went, so I shot her, click, and I went over here, click, click, and I went click, 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 click. And so I shot, I think a total of five or six frames. And so then I stitched them together. So I have a 200 millimeter lens with a 200 millimeter depth of field, which is pretty shallow. I'm creating an image that is a, a canvas of about a 50 millimeter, maybe about a 35, maybe, maybe somewhere around there, millimeter canvas. But at a depth of field you could never get with a wide angle lens. Yeah, I usually start with the middle one, and then I kind of go, okay, good, boom, 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 and then I just put it all together in Photoshop. It's really not very difficult. Is it easy to stitch them together in Photoshop? Yep, photo merge, just like that. Automatically? Automatically, no, no. So long as you have your 
when I say this, your parallax, right? So on the, it happens that the cannon, I'm sure they thought this out. They put a little mid-mount, you know, the mounter, you know, so it's not hanging away out there. It's just a mid-mount uh, bracket. And that's pretty close to your nodal point. So I don't even use it. I don't even care about my nodal point. I just shoot it. So, so it's, it's not, it's, on my other lenses, I get my nodal point all perfect. Um, and I have, you know, there's also tons of tutorials on that. But, but on here, I just put it in the middle, bop, 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 shoot across. It's not uh, difficult at all. Well, on a tripod, now, there, you don't have to. My son does this handheld all the time. I always do it on a tripod, because I'm old school. And I believe that sharpness is important, and I always put on a tripod. Almost 99% of the time, I'm on a tripod. And so that's just my thing. But you can do it handheld. Are you manual focus? No, I just, I back focus. So I back focus, bloop, right on your eyeball. And then I go click, 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 and I just shoot. I don't, I don't have to touch. It doesn't zoom in and out at that point because I'm firing at the finger, and it doesn't, doesn't activate the focus, autofocus. That's turned off. I always use uh, back focus. But here's my point. One light, you have a beautiful model, a great location. But you could do this anywhere. You know how many locations you could do this around here and just in this valley or this, uh, this um, you know, New York City and up to whatever, Hudson or whatever. There's so many great locations you could do this. It's so simple. And so it's one light, though. Here I've got a girl in the water, and I've just got the, the, the beauty dish right over the top. Actually, there's a 36-inch wrapper box right over the top. And she's just rolling around on this, in this. I, I brought this, uh, you know, this piece of cloth that I bought at, you know, Joanne Hancock's or whatever. And just like maybe seven, eight bucks in cloth. And I was using it, it was just kind of a, like, a, like a curtain, you know, a see-through curtain kind of thing. And I just said, let's do something different. Would you, do you want to get wet? She said, fine. I just threw it in the water. I said, just start spinning around with it. And that's what she did. Right over the top. I'm standing on the dock. She's in the water. I'm shooting down. My assistant's just holding the light right over the top. So it's right over my lens again, right over the top of my lens, shooting right over the top. 90 degrees. Just like I do every time. Here, just right over the top. Shoot. Yeah, it's, the, the source is pointing toward her. You, you know, there's a little bit of shadow under here. The thing is, is I got so much ambient, that's when my shutter, I have to adjust my shutter. So if I had gone up in my shutter a little bit more, it might have gotten a little bit darker around here. But I'm letting a lot of the natural light come in on, this thing, on the scene, too. Um, OK, so this was done. Westcott actually came out to uh, Arizona. We went up and shot this. And this is with the new uh, Canon 35mm 1.4 version 2 lens at 1.4 with a six-stop ND filter. Go to Westcott uh, website, go to their education, and there's a whole behind the scenes of me doing this. And so, and it's free. But I'm shooting wide open. I got my six stop ND, so I get my aperture 1.4. That's a really wide aperture, folks, outdoors. And so, uh, what happens is um, I can get that shallow depth of field with a 35 millimeter. This is a 35 millimeter semi wide angle lens. And I'm knocking my shutter speed up to where I get a darker background. So, it's about you know, five in the afternoon, so it's starting to get a little dark. At high noon, you'd have a hard time with doing this with that dark of a background, unless you had a really, really, really powerful strobe, like F32 power. Um, but the point is, is, and this is, this is a little more drama portrait, right? So that means drama portrait is when you darken the background. Lifestyle portrait is when you let the balance a little more, more natural. I love the drama portrait. I don't know, that's just me. I like it. And so I think there's another one here. This is a little bit closer. Oh, I just love that. And, and, and Bryce is a great, and her skin is like perfect. I mean, I did a little bit of retouching, but I, and people say, I think you overdid the skin. No, you don't know Bryce. She's got this really beautiful skin. But, no, well, she's got a little, she just showed up. No makeup artist, we just showed up. And she did a little makeup. But the point is, is look how shallow that is. That's moving a little tighter. So I'm like right here. I'm like right in here like this, with a 35 millimeter. And um, I love it. Do, okay, so again, it'll go back, go back. I'm at aperture 1.4. That's the widest that lens will go, okay? So that gives me the shallow depth of field. And then um, I'm at probably around 200th of a second. I think it's actually more like 100 because it was, the sun was going down. But it's pretty as high as I can go in my sink. 
And then I got my power would put out what would be, that would counter a six stop ND filter. So if you can walk that back, that's probably about F11, I don't even know, I don't know my math very well. Somewhere around F11 light. Now, again, high noon would be a little harder to do this because you'd have to be, you'd have to be sunny 16, which is 116th of uh, F16, and then you go one stop darker, that's a 200th F16, and you need to go two stops darker, that'd be uh, at 22 power at F, at one, 200th of a second. That's a good question. So he's asking, okay, so I'm out there in the scenario and I've got my, my parameters, right? So generally, I go, I gotta be at one 200th of a second because I gotta overpower the sun. Then I go, okay, I gotta, I gotta kick a lot of light on there so I'm gonna put my, a lot of power out of my strobe, right? So then I go and do a test. And I go, okay, I'm a little dark. What I might do then is raise my ISO from 100 to say, 160 or you know, whatever, I walk my, my uh, uh, ISO up a little bit, um, but I, because I, I can't change my f-stop, that's 1.4. I'm locked into that with a six-stop ND. So really, it, it gets to be, you gotta have a pretty powerful strobe. Um, we're gonna do, I'm gonna show you an example where I did a, a speed light with high-speed syncing. That's different, but it's similar results. So let's, 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 but that's a good question. What happens is you're almost at the mercy of you got you can't go any wider your or you know your f stop um, you might have to walk it down I don't want to walk it down to 2.8 because then I want my 1.4 background shallow to the field the other thing I do is I I can maybe fudge by going in a little bit on the box that gives me a little more power you could do this take out the inner baffle or take off the front diffusion. That gives you probably a, at least a maybe three quarter stop. So there's a few times I've done that. But it's really a tough one out there because you, only, you don't have as many variables to mix up as you, as you would normally in a studio or whatever. But the results, are, you can do it. That's not high speed sync, folks. That's just right uh, in the camera. And um, now here's the same, this is earlier, so this is about an hour earlier than that one. And <clears throat> here's a 7200, zoomed in, and my, this is the, the box right here, the, the, the 24 inch. And I got my assistant on uh, with a paint pole, and we, we put that about three, four feet from my subject, because outdoors, you, with so much ambient, it softens it up. So in a studio, I would go at two feet from my subject, but outdoors, I might go three to four feet, because I got so much ambient, it softens it up. But this is more lifestyle. So in this scenario, I don't need to get a two stop darker background. So that gives me two more stops to play with that I didn't have doing that other scenario. And so in this scenario, I was at two of the second. Um, I can't remember my, I, they have it on the, on the Westcott uh, website. They have this, all the specs, they show the picture and they show the specs. So, but this is more lifestyle. See the difference between the two? Now personally, I like the other one. I like that drama. But your client may say, I want more lifestyle. Does that make sense? And this is easy to do. Again, look at the sun. I put the sun so that it lights this, but not her face. That's light in her face. Boom, right over the top. So I'm choosing, I'm choosing the quality of light on her face. As an artist, I'm making that choice and that, that decision. And so therefore, um, you know, now that, that gets a little bright there, but I'm letting it blow out a little bit, but, and sometimes I might let it go across a little bit of the cheek, but um, you gotta ro rotate your model to match where that position is. And so here's what happens. When, we, when Westcott showed up, Brandon was there, and he's like, okay, um, where do you wanna shoot? And I'm like, there's the sun, there's the dock, right here's the, t the, the camera, and we set it all up within, 10 seconds I knew where to shoot because there's, I don't have any options, right? I don't want to shoot this way because the sun's going to come across and hit her in the face. So I got to, but look how shallow the, the depth of field is. You don't have to have that critical background. It's just like, well, let it go. Let the background go. So I just did this last week. My brother Jim was fly fishing. I was up camping. I never go camping. I've been, uh, I've been a photographer, right? Chasing my career. 
So they said, let's go camping. I said, okay. So he was out getting ready to go fishing. And I ran out there and I did a portrait of him with speed lights. So I had this, no, I had this box, but I had a mount to put two speed lights, but really that would be better. This, this, this would be actually have been better. Um, but I put two speed lights and I piggybacked uh, the two, I just bungee corded the two together. And they're the 600, so they were all wireless. And I set, set it so it's high speed syncing. So this is at one eight thousandths of a second at 1.4 aperture, the 35 millimeter lens. So again, same technique. But now I'm shooting, the sun is just beaming early morning. I just set it up, there goes the box, beep, right over the top of his head. And I got this really kind of a simple little portrait. And you could do this all day long. You could do surfers, you could do, you name it. In any scenario, you could shoot this. And again, you gotta position your subject, look at the little shadow, 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 that's the position of the light right over the top. I didn't have an assistant. I actually mounted everything onto my tripod, so I didn't even have a light stand. It was, I, I have a behind the scenes picture if you want to see that. I didn't put it in, I should have done it. But it's not, it's so simple. It's on my tripod. I'm walking around, going, <laughs> click. And he's like, I got to fish, I got to fish, hurry, hurry. And then now he likes the picture. And I happened to see Jesus. Um, um, this was at another workshop. He was in one of the participants, and we were waiting for the model to show up, and I snapped one of him, and then I did my magic. One light right there. That's it. One light. No fill card, nothing. Gray background. We had it popped up right there. And um, you could do these really cool portraits um, with one light. And this is the little teeny 20-inch uh, rapid box. I did it at a workshop. Black piece of black cloth. No fill card, just right in there, because you can tell there's no fill card. And um, really simple. And we have a print coming out. I love prints. This is a 60 inch umbrella, on the and she's laying on the ground. Um, again, I'm positioning the umbrella so that I get the shadow, 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 shadow. Do you see where that is? I position it up and down until I get the shadow where I want. Once you understand that, people go, where do you put your light? Well, just follow the shadow. It's not hard at all, folks. But again, because I've done what? How many thousands of portraits? You get pretty good. And I used to paint houses in college. And when I, I always tell people when I first started painting, I got in the paint crew, and then I had my own paint company, but paint crew, I'd take a bucket of paint and I'd slop it over everything. And I'd pull it out, drip, 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 and it'd be all over my shoes and the, you know. And it was like, you had to learn how to paint, right? It took a while. But here's the most interesting thing that happened out of that whole experience, is that when I would walk into someone's house or a hotel or whatever, I could look over and I could say, a professional did that or not. An amateur painted that or a professional? By just looking at how clean the lines are of someone painting, right? So that's a, there's a nice little line right there, see? That's a clean line. Now, if, you, if you're an amateur painting that, you'd have paint slopping on both sides, both colors mixing, you know? And so, but, but why I'm saying this is because as you get better at lighting, you get to see that subtleties a lot quicker. So you know where to put that little shadow because you've done it so many times, because you know now where to, how to put it. This was in Iceland, 36 inch rapid box uh, from Westcott. And uh, oh, the wind, my goodness, was blowing like crazy. And um, um, I actually snapped, one, I took two lights, one modifier. And the first, well, I don't know, couple days, we snapped one of the lights in half because the wind would be like this. And this guy that was holding up for me, he was uh, Reinar from, uh, he was a local photographer that kind of helped out. But literally he'd like, and he'd come back and set it up, hold it up. And one time I ripped the right off, so I had a, luckily a second light. But the modifier held up. I can't even tell you that. But this is a six stop ND, 2.8 aperture, shot right there on location. And, um, Simple, simple. We did it, we did, that. Um, oh, here's Bryce again. That's a 22 inch, but let's show it. Here it is again. Now in this scenario, what I did was, I set up, had a high sink, so I was at 200th a second. And, it, and I was trying to get the sky blue, and I was like, mm, nah. It was all black in here, you know? And so I just went, okay, walk that shutter down to around 1 25th of a second. And I uh, drug it in a little bit, and I still had the same amount of light over her head, same, just all over the top of the lens. And, and it came, made it more of a lifestyle shoot. And so that's all me by myself, folks. That's not, nobody even assisted me on this. This is where we stayed, and I said, 
I got up, I go, oh, this is a gorgeous morning. Let's go out and, into the reeds and near the lake, and we shot this. So I am my own assistant sometimes. That's why I stay in shape. And then when the wind was blowing so bad, we thought we'd try to find a little place that was down, down. And look at this. This is not Arizona, folks. That's Iceland. You can't find that just anywhere. But one light, one light over the top. Are you getting the theme here? Are you getting the theme? One light, gray background. That was painted, uh, that shirt was painted on him. It was kind of a special event that I went to. Five foot or five feet. This is the Zeppelin. The Zeppelin, the biggest one is just 59 inch, I believe is what they say, 59, it's five feet roughly. I take the front diffusion off, I leave the inner diffusion, I put it at about 12 feet, 10 to 12 feet. And what it does is, it gives you a really sharp edge as a shadow, Not, you know, it's more like kind of like the Vogue cosmopolitan kind of feel on white. This is so easy, a white wall, 10 feet. And it, it's up so high, you, it's not even, you, you don't even know it's there. It's behind you. And you just go pop, 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 and you just shoot away. And I do this at my workshops. So, oh my goodness, look at this. Look at this. I love it. It's a print. We are in a great age. Absolutely amazing age. You know what's really amazing? This is better than any darkroom print you could ever get. And, you know, I, I was pretty picky about my prints in the old days. I mean, I was the old Ansel Adams, you know, you know wannabe. Um, very cool. See, that just came out while we're sitting here talking. I like that. No darkroom. I didn't have to go in there and breathe all the chemicals. Oh, I just hit the button. Sorry, let me go back. Yes? Well, no, because it's dead center over the camera. Um, if you won't go to offset it slightly, then the shadows start popping up. That's an artistic decision. So you, you set it up right above. Right above. I like it right over the top. Why? I don't know, folks. I just, my intuition tells me. We said this earlier. Do you know that when it comes to the creative process, it's a tough thing because we're human. We don't want anyone to criticize us. And so when you take a picture, you go, did I do it right? Am I on the right track? Who's going to criticize me, right? Put it on Facebook. You'll get someone to criticize you. But the point is, is I always say there's one way you can never lose. And that is follow your intuition and stick with it and let the chips fall. And then you go and build a body of work and you become a rock star. But if you go and try to follow everyone else's intuition or the trends or whatever it is, and then you become a bunch of mush, you know, mixed in, nobody knows who you are. Follow your intuition and build a body of work. That's what I say. Seven footer at seven, this is the uh, uh, parabolic, parabolic at seven feet behind my head. Did you find all these beautiful women, did they, did they them? Okay, that's a good question because when you start out, you go, hey baby, you know, I wanna take a picture. <laughs> She slaps you, right? <laughs> and then with time, you get to go and you show images and you recruit. So part of the, being a photographer is learning how to recruit. So if you're a guy, don't go up to a 16-year-old at the mall and ask <laughs> to take her picture, unless you have your wife with you, maybe. Have her help you. But you gotta learn to recruit. Can you show them anything? Like, I mean, I to ask people. This is it, folks. Oh, what happened? Oh, my iPhone. The, the iPhone, look. This is it, man. This is my calling card right here constantly. I'm showing everybody, the waitress, anyone that I think has a great look. I'm like, hey, hey, I'm a photographer. I'd love to photograph you sometime. And here it is. At this point, you just have to say, I'm Joel Grimes. No, that's not true. No, but you know, um, the fact is, is I got to recruit and I get turned down too. People go, huh? No, I'm not interested. Cross light. That somehow popped up, and it was not supposed to do that. All right, so one light, I showed you this earlier, my cowboy here, one light, uh, 36 by 48. Uh, they, uh, Westcott calls it their large softbox. It's sitting right out over here. And guess what, what direction is the sun going in? The same direction. You don't put your softbox over here. You put it in the same direction. That way all the lights, the, the, the lines follow themselves. 
and you got to get a really craggly old guy that's been weathered a little bit. And it's fun. This is fun, not rocket science. But I was there because I put it together. That's the key to the whole thing. And here's, here's the, the sh I was, he got up on the horse and I shot with my 20, I think it's a 24 millimeter. Was and the previous is 7200? No, same thing, 24 to 70. I mean, uh, 24, 24 to, yeah, 24 to 70 at 24. Or are anything stitched first? No, straight? no. Uh, sometimes what I do is I take, like for example, I'll take this section right here and I'll go, I'll push it a little bit over here just to make it a little, because you know what I said it, when I shot it, he was a little too centered. I center all the time, folks. But he wasn't like dead center, he was a little off center, so I just stretched this part of the frame just slightly. You don't always want to do that, but. That, that print. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay, I get to show off again. Um, this is what it's all about. Again, having it in print. Isn't that incredible? This is for sale, by the way. And it's not at Peter Lick's prices either. Um, oops, I'm all hooked up here. Okay, so let's keep going. We gotta keep going, we gotta keep going. We got time restraints here. We just, I can go all night, would you like to do that? Um, there's that one. I think I got three of them here. There's a, there's a six stop ND filter at 2.8 and I really wanted to go out of focus. Oh my gosh, it's keeping going here. Uh, here's a cross light, um, Russell Brown. This background I shot in uh, England and I went in and I just kind of tweaked it all in Photoshop and made it look like a, I, I threw a texture over the top of it and made it look like an old painting. And uh, again, simple, because I shot him on gray. Makes it easy. No cutouts. I'd have to cut out all his hair. Blending mode. And this is a, a seven footer with a, I printed this background on my 60 inch Canon printer. I printed the background and we just tacked it to the wall. Took a texture, just printed it out. I, had, I did like six or seven of them. And I, I keep hauling them all over my workshops. And that way we can see it right in the camera. So it's kind of fun. But really the gray is so much easier. That's one big source. Same thing, eight foot or a, a seven foot octo with a little fill card. And um, I went, I made that, folks, with a piece of uh, needle and a thread. They just made it. And I went online and figured out how to make one of those. You know, I just went on YouTube and found out and uh, dropped it in. So you, 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 you devise your own props on this? I'm a one man show a lot of times. <laughs> you know, it's so much fun when I do a commercial shoot. And then they bring everything. You got, you got the producers, you got all the crew, 25 people. But sometimes I'm doing my thing. And I can't afford you know, to spend, you know, have five bodies there sometimes. I just go, hey, let's just do it. Let's go have fun. I usually have my assistant there. But sometimes my assistant you know, isn't there. All right, so we got to do a shoot here in a minute. OK. How close is your studio subject to the About that, not very, not very far away. Cross light, cross light. This was actually uh, the canvas, so it wasn't a gray. But look at a beautiful model, cross light, you can't go wrong. We had a hair a stylist on that and a wardrobe specialist. But um, this is just a wall and a big seven footer. That's it. This becomes the fill card, the wall does. So simple. And this is zoomed in a little tighter. Money in the bank, folks. Money in the bank if you just know how to use it. Here's a seven footer uh, with a three stop ND filter. So I wanted a 2.8, but I was in a kind of an, a, a, an environment where I had lots of uh, daylight. Um, so she's in focus, her eyes are, and then the background's out of focus. There's my dad. No, I just, I'd say that. Yeah. Um, he was one of those time period actors that I, he brought in for a shoot, and uh, Bob, wonderful guy. But I backed, the, I backed my seven footer up to make it a little harsher. On purpose, I wanted a little bit edgier look for a guy. Does that make sense? Just back it up. There's move it in. Tight, tight, tight. Really just out of frame. And this fill card is really smoothing that out over there, too. Uh, one big, huge seven footer and a big, huge piece of foam core. Seven foot, or a, a four by eight. 
and it just bounces back in. Still cross light, but I'm bouncing it countering by my ambient or my reflective. So that's my other variable. Remember I told you? Briefly, you mentioned all the time natural density filters. Why would you use them? Density filter only to inc uh, run my f-stop up to get shallow depth of field. Because what happens is if I have ambient, I can't do that. It starts to enc encroach into my scene. Light contamination is what happens. There's that girl kept jumping around, remember? This is, this is two big seven-footers about 10 feet from my subject. So here's Russell Brown. We did an event, and he, he was dressing up. And these are backgrounds from England. Don't tell the English people that uh, the uh, people in the UK, I took their you know, backgrounds. But um, a lot of times, they don't let you have tripods in there, so you got to handhold them. Um, but uh, look how simple this is, folks. Cross light, one light, beautiful light. Make a living at this. Rock the world. Go out and create images. This is just that one event. All right, so last thing we'll do, and then we gotta, we, I got to move really fast, is simulating sunlight. Look at just one light, 25 to 28 feet back with an 8-inch reflector, and bam, against a white wall. It's really simple because you're simulating the sun. Now here I did the same thing, only I took a big piece of foam core and bounced back into it. So I softened the overall look, still had that harshness on the eyelashes, but it's soft overall. So it's really fun. Way back, like I'm in the studio right here, it's way back, 28 feet back. She's laying down on a white sweep. I got an apple box and I got a big piece of foam core here and a big piece of foam core here. And it's bouncing light back in and I'm standing over the top. Here, same thing, 28 feet back. Why is 28 feet? Because that makes the same size as the sun. Makes an eight inch reflector the same size as the sun, roughly. And so um, it's way up high, but I got a big couple pieces of foam core down here. So it's bouncing back into here to make that shadow a little softer. And then here's Karan Clemens, a gold medalist. Whoa, that was my uh, Karan Clemens. And this is just same, same simple thing. Bam. All right, so I'm at uh, 160 shutter speed. Because pocket wizards don't like to go at 200, at the, right at your sh shutter speed. Sometimes you get a little, little bounce. And so I go 160. I'm going to go ISO 100. And 7.1 is my usually my studio uh, aperture because that's close to my sweet spot on my lens. So I know that from you know years and years of photographing. And then let me get my cam ranger. Let's see, I turned it on. Here it is. And it's, I got to kind of coordinate my, uh, I got to turn it on. Uh, I don't usually use my laptop. We used it this morning. Um, but I usually use my iPad and my iPhone as my viewing thing. And so it's really a fun tool to have uh, for your clients and for doing all sorts of really fun things uh, like multiple uh, uh, HDR exposures for uh, bracketing ISO, things like that. Okay, and so w let's just test this. Let's see where's my test button. Okay, test. Yes. And then, let's see, we were about, yeah, we were about there, I guess, before. And then um, we got to raise this up. And let me just shoot one from here to make sure it's hooked up. So it says failure. I'm used to that. <laughs> Let's try it again. Sometimes you have to do, oh, I got to go up here and connect. So you got to go to your Wi Fi and connect here. Where's my, it'll pop up here in a minute. It'll, Cause it takes about 30 seconds or so to pop up. So it should pop up here. Uh, don't make a fool of me. Any other questions as we're waiting? So why don't we come in here? And um, so let's do this. So come toward me, come to me right about there. And so now I'm gonna bring this, well, first of all, set my, I always shoot a tripod. You don't always have to but I'm gonna get my height the way I want it. Some people say, you shoot low up. Yes, I do, I don't know why, but that's the way I do it. Um, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Let's do a really tight one, really tight headshot right there. Okay, so hold on a second, make sure I'm focused. I'm back focusing. I don't use the focus on the front. And we're gonna bring this down to where it is just over my lens. Did we bring the fill, the fill card up here? Oh yes, I think I saw it earlier, the reflector. Um, it might be on the floor here. Here it is. So I use a reflector. Ooh, that's 
Maybe that's. Is that the, is that the reflector in there? Yes. Yeah. Pretty small, but it's all. So, um, well, I can do. I can, uh, maybe I might. Hold on a second, though. I, I can usually do it by myself. I'm my own assistant sometimes. Okay. So we're gonna do this right here. Okay. I don't know what my output here is yet, so we'll just fire one off here. Ready? One, two, three. What we want is gorgeous, beautiful light. Make her look like, a, you know, a million dollars. Here we go. Oh, I gotta go over here and click it. I go over here and click it. So let's see our exposure. It must be downloading the raw or something, because it is really taking its time. And it wasn't like this this morning. So that's just it. We just went up one floor, and things go all haywire. Look at that. How long is that going to take? Come on. I don't know what it's doing. But you can see it's going to hollow her cheeks. There it goes. Hollowing her cheeks, oh my gosh, because I'm so close, right? And I usually tilt this down a little bit, but let's see if we can do that here without knocking off the pocket wizards. And I can just turn this down just a little bit. Turn it down. Ah, that's about as far as I can go. And then raise it back up. Right about there. Okay. And then let's put this back up here. And let's try it again. All right, so let's back, I won't go so tight. I love tight though. I love chopping off heads. Has nothing to do with being jealous about people with hair. <laughs> okay, but I like, I just love that tight, that tight look. So let's do this. I'm gonna go back here just a little bit. And that background's pretty dark. We got a little bit of value. Now, white or silver? So silver's gonna kick a little more. White's a little softer. Depends on the subject, depends on what I'm doing. But right now, I think we're just gonna do a little silver here. Ready, one, two, three, okay? So again, Let's see how long it takes to get her to pop up here. It says JPEG on there, so it should be instant, but um, anyways, what it, what it gives me is the ability to talk more between shots, <laughs> which I don't have any problems doing. Um, so I'm bouncing, so really it's like, they call this clamshell, I guess, you know, you got bounce, whatever. Um, if you don't know all the names of the lighting, don't worry, um, I don't either. Um, that's gorgeous light. I mean, you know, again, we're just kind of standing here. She's not really doing her thing. But, um, but we can, you know, we can maybe do something a little more. What, what, I love, I love cheeks. So, so is this at full power? No. This is at about half power. Um, we're at 7.1. So pull your hair back. I want to see, see a little more, a little more. Uh, Ready for no, no, just, just kind of pull it back like we did before. A little bit like that. And then let's try another one here. And I'm gonna zoom in again. I love it tight. I'm gonna, and we blew this up. Oh my gosh, was it sharp? It is like unbelievable. So I gotta make sure I'm. Hold on a second. I'm gonna loosen this up just a little bit so I can go right on the eyeball, right there. Okay, right there. We're gonna pop this silver right in here. Ready? So straight. Everything straight again. Straight. I love this right here. I'm gonna zoom in even more. Bro. Focus on the eyeball. One, two, three. Right there. Tighten that down. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That looks good. <coughs> so, up until about six, uh, seven years ago, maybe eight, I had never photographed beautiful women like beauty fashion. Never. And um, I got this call from a magazine. They said, do we want some beauty uh, lifestyle stuff? I'm like, hmm, well, I'm not beauty lifestyle. They said, no, we love you. See your work. We love it. We want you to come out. I don't know. I said like three times. I, you know, that's not really my thing. No, come on, come on out. So I show up. There's 13 models, gorgeous home. I have three days of shooting. And I just started working with my three light approach stuff. And I, anyways, I photographed all these models. And I came back and I was showing them to my wife. And she said, do you really have to photograph beautiful models like this? <laughs> And I said, well, yes, because it helps me work on my lighting. And I've been photographing models ever. She bought it. I've been working on it ever since. <laughs> but it is true. The hardest light on the planet is beauty fashion or beauty headshots. Beauty, beauty, beauty. And so you can master beauty. You can master anything. You can get a guy in a, a, a cowboy hat and a horse, and you can shoot what I crazy. So it's really, this is, that still don't, it says not connecting. Um, it could be I got some really low batteries here because that might have been left on. Oh my goodness. Starting session. Um, 
It's doing its own thing. But, you, but see, here's my thing. Here's my point. Also, since I hadn't done beauty fashion, it was a new arena for me. So I was like, wow, and excited. And I'm just trying to do all sorts of stuff. Um, so my, here's my thing. If you, if you shoot beauty fashion all the time, go do a series on old cowboys or something. Do the opposite of what you're doing right now. That'll help you, you know, grow in areas that you can now blend the two together. Anything yet? Okay, failure. That was what I usually got when I got my grades. Okay, so let's go start. Uh, fail, okay. Um, I don't know, folks. Well, we got, what, three, two pictures up so far, so connecting to camera. It, it might have jumped. It might have jumped. And that's what happens is um, it did not want to. Um, yeah, Cam Ranger, there it is. Um, and it's clicking on it. And it's just not opening up. And she looks wonderful. Um, well, sorry to tell you that, you know, putting my glasses on might help. Um, let's see if it captured. Let me fire one off here. See, it captured it. Okay, now, you, were you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's go back. Um, now watch it show up on this one, but not the other one. Look at that. So why will, will it not show this one? I was photographing his computer room once, and I could not get my camera. It would like... It wouldn't, it would, it would, it would take, but it would fire. So I go over and push all the buttons, work. And then it worked, and then it wouldn't work. And it was like, you know, wires are coming out of computers and everything. Who knows what kind of gremlin? No. I went back to my studio, everything worked perfect. But in that room, I couldn't get it to work. So weird things happen. But um, look at the hollowness of your cheeks. Do you see this, folks? Yeah, but here's the thing. Women love hollow cheeks, right? So you, this is a tool that you can use to help. Now, she's got hollow cheeks anyways, but the point is, is we're enhancing those even more. So this is the beauty of lighting. If you can get it down, you can work it, you can fine tune it. This is not complicated. It's not expensive. Not a whole lot of money invested here. We moved around. No, but see, when I have a gray, just plain old gray, I'm going to knock, put a background in, she can be right up against it. Here, let me, let me explain something about all this combination of like shutter speeds, flash durations, all this stuff. It sounds like a big mountain to climb. But if I could explain this to you, you might understand this. I teach a lot. And I know this, that when I, when I teach like, or when I, when I sit in a class and I try to learn something, about 20% of it sticks, okay? And that's because our brains work that way. And my brain is about half brain anyway. So it doesn't, it takes a lot. But my point is, when I'm teaching, when I'm learning Photoshop, I cannot sit in a class and learn Photoshop. I have to get the, the DVD or whatever, or the, the tutorial, and run it 30 times. And then I'm like, oh, I gotta hold the shift down and then do it, right? And so, but when it comes to this kind of stuff, when, when I, I always say there's no, there's no such thing as a stupid question. But they're lazy questions, meaning that you want me to solve the problem for you, right? But however, if I solve the problem for you, you're not going to remember it. If you go and solve the problem, you'll remember it, meaning that you go out and go, oh my gosh, I forgot to put the sink at you know, the right thing. And then you go and you remember not to do that. So my thing is, is that the best way to learn is to go and get out and find a model and make all the mistakes. Then you go, oh, okay, I'll never do that again. And I still make mistakes. In fact, I was teaching a, a, a class and it had like 300 people and I was uh, showed up and they had all the stuff for me, right? It was all set up, I mean, the booms and stuff. And this old boom, it had a big old, like, like metal weight that was built onto it. And I said, you know, I'm not the smartest guy on the planet. And then I turned and went, bang! And about knocked myself out in front of 300 people. And I said, told you. You know, it's like I make dumb mistakes and I'm as human as anyone else. And so I fumble, fiddle, and I, you know, finally get it to work. And so you have to do the same thing. Thing. I was teaching at Create Alive and I was trying to give all my calculations and I went the wrong way. I mean, I went, you went to go darken it and I went lighten in front of a lot of people. So I make mistakes all the time. And so the good news is people go, hey, guess what, Joel? You're human. Yeah, I make mistakes. So you got to go out and grab a subject. 
Um, you don't need a lot. See how tight I am here? I had a studio in Pasadena. Um, and we had, I, had a, I had a nine footer sweep like this. And I had about, mm, about this far back, maybe a little longer. But almost 80, 90% of all my pictures were shot this close. So you don't need a lot of room. That means you can probably do this in your living room. So grab a subject. What's your excuse now? I don't have a studio. Yeah, you do. Your living room. Do it. Grab. You know, I, I, um, my first uh, sports subjects, people say, how do you end up photographing um, Reggie Bush and Devin Hester and Blake Griffin and all these, you know, $100 million athletes? How do you, how do you get there? I said, I had to start with the high school kid next door. I had to work my way up. So whatever subject matter you're picking right now, you're probably not going to get the best of the best subjects, but then you work your way up. And then you get that iPhone, you go, iPad, and you're going, hey, look what I can do. Can I, can I get you in front of my lens? And you get these great pictures. And then pretty soon, you're up at B&H speaking. <laughs> Seriously. Do you shoot vertical? I do, but you know, yeah. You know what's funny is a lot of times my horizontal or vertical is depicted or determined by the format. So 35 millimeters really long and narrow. So when I flip it vertical, I got a lot of top and bottom. So I have to trim it a little bit when I do my, okay. and I also add, I'll take the gray. So I shoot the I shoot the certain subject in gray. And I stretch the gray out. Then I get a little square picture. So this one right here, that's vertical. Whoops. But I added a little gray left and right, and then added the texture. So it's a little more squared up. Does that make sense? Because I shot four by five for years, so I love that little square you know, format. And I shot six by seven centimeter. And so, um, but I do. It depends upon the Yeah. And I shot four by five Type 55 Polaroid. And about 90% of them are all vertical. Now with the 35 millimeter, I do a lot of horizontals. It's kind of interesting how that works. I love panorama. Also, think about this. Your website. What's the format? Horizontal, right? So when you put a vertical on a big old canvas like this, that doesn't show much real estate, does it? So I love panos. I love that wide cinematic look. So I think it's a lot of it has to be determined by kind of the, you know, the time we're in, the whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know what's really fun is when you do like little like three side by side, three verticals side by side, and show that. It's really a beautiful little way. Yes? Are you using your 24 to 70 for these close-ups? Because I've read that wide angles will distort features. That's right. And where did you read that? In a photography book. Yeah. Well, OK. So generally speaking, you say a portrait lens is, say, 70 to 100-ish mark. I'm shooting at 20, this is at 50. So we were at, no, that was 70 at last one, but I shoot a lot of 24 millimeter portraits. There's distortion, and I don't mind it. That's my vision. You may not like it. So here's what people say, what's the right perfect lens to buy? I go, I, it's like asking me what kind of car to drive. What's your budget? You know, what are you doing? You, you haul in manure? You don't want a Mercedes, you know, convertible for that. <laughs> You got to figure out what your needs are, and then I love this. I love 24 to 70 is perfect for, uh, format for me in a studio. I had the 24 to 105 version four kit lens, and you know what? This is no joke. I used to. My wife kind of looks at all the internet stuff. She looks up my name and she finds out what all this stuff. And there was this, you know, yeah, for, there was this forum, and they were saying, well, Joel Grimes, I saw was using the 24 to 105. F4, what do you think? And someone said, he must not be a professional. <laughs> That's a great lens. <laughs> you know, I shot a lot of sports figures with that lens. And I finally went and upgraded to this lens. But you don't have to have the best, most expensive lens on the planet to shoot, especially if you're at F8, F7.1. You're not going to see any difference. Not really. So my point is, is um, but if someone's going to tell you something, and the odds are it's probably not going to be 100% correct because everyone has different preferences. And so I love wide angle. That's me. So I would test it. Get a subject, shoot it, and you go, mm, I don't like the distortion. Get a longer lens and then play with that. And this is a good point. This is, this is great. And since he's an art director, he knows this. Okay. When I 
started out in photography. I was in Denver, was cutting my teeth. I was shooting architecture. Then someone asked to put some subject in. I went to shooting people. And I started shooting more people, strobing, all that stuff. And I built a body of work. But I, here's how I thought. This is a little tip. This is, this is a bonus. I thought that I had to create a body of work that met my client's needs. Does that not make sense? So Hewlett Packard, actually Hewlett Packard had two plants. One up in toward Colorado Springs, one down in, or one, uh, one uh, up in uh, Fort Collins. And so I shot for Hewlett Packard. And I shot for uh, Quest, or now, now CenturyLink. I shot for Comcast, all these. But I tried to build my needs to meet my clients, or my look to meet my clients' needs. That's not a bad way to create a living. But here's the problem with that. Every other photographer is trying to find out what needs Hewlett Packard and whatever is having, and they try to build a portfolio that meets the client's needs. And so now you're competing against all the other photographers. <coughs> now, here's a better way. It's a more of a risk, but I learned this later in life, is you create a body of work that fits you to the T, and then you go and do it really well. See, I do all my own retouching. I'm colorblind. You say, how is that possible? Well, I'm just going and doing my thing. I put it out there. Let it go. I don't even, I don't even care. I mean, I care, but I don't, I don't worry about my color retouching. It doesn't drive me nuts. It doesn't drive me nuts. And so I create a look, and then all of a sudden, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of art directors that are that work hopefully he's getting in front of. And one day they go, oh my gosh, we need this guy. Hire him. And here's the, here's the beauty of that, is when you go and build a body of work that meets your client's needs, you can never make as much money as when you go and build a body of work that fits you to the T, and then all of a sudden they go and say, find you, or you, they, they discover you through your, hopefully, your, your marketing. And now you are the person that owns that look and you go, ching, ching, you charge a whole lot more money. So in the end, here's the fun part about that, is now when I get called in to photograph Blake Griffin or some famous athlete, and I have him for 50, they say, we have 15 minutes. Can you do it? No problem. You nervous? No. You know why? I've done it a thousand times. I can do it in my sleep. It's my look. I own the look. And I go in, hey, how you doing? Let's do it. Bop, bop, bop. Hope Solo. I had 15 minutes. Bam, it's done. I get my shot because it's me. It, it's easy. It's hard. It's easy to be me. It's hard to be someone else. And so a lot of photographers are trying to be other people and they can't do it because it's just not the way it is. So I'm saying to you, take the risk, go out and build a body work that fits you to the T, do it good, repeat it, and then put it out there and let it happen. And all of a sudden now you become one of a kind in a, in a sea of a lot of photographers. And that's the beauty of it. Now, and, and so I'm more comfortable doing this, what I'm doing today, than I was back to trying to, well, I had to make a living. I had four kids at home. You know, I had to pay bills. But that sometimes chokes you. And so don't let it choke you. Go out and do what you love. And I was shooting Type 55, and I ended up doing some crazy ad campaigns with that big, huge camera, shooting portraits with a 4x5. And it launched me on a national level. And so, but I took a risk. And how did I do that? Every Every minute I had that I wasn't shooting, I grabbed a subject, brought him in my studio, or went out, and I shot Polaroid Type 55, and I built the body of work to go out and then put it in front of the right people. Or I did a workbook, and then I did uh, uh, Ad Edge. But the point is, is um, I took a risk. And that's the beauty of it. Take a risk, and you'll go a lot further in life. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.